thank you, Leila, for the introduction. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be, to be here and to share with you some uh, of our results. And um, <clears throat> I'm coming from, from Switzerland. I work at the Institute for Infectious Diseases here, that is part of one of the largest hospitals in Switzerland. And our, our institute is also part of this large complex of, um, of research and, um, and also clinical applications um, in Switzerland. So since, uh, well, a, a year ago, we started with, with applying Oxon Nanopore Technologies protocols and developing that for, for our own application, understanding that the real-time acquisition of data and also the possibility to have everything in the same house um, from, from the sample to um, the analysis was key for clinical applications. Uh, as you can see here, we got our first mean iron. We spent a lot of time uh, building our own cluster and developing some, some nice protocols to get back to those long uh, molecules that are very nicely then sequenced with the mean ion. And more recently, we bought the grid ion. And uh, we, we had, we, of course, we have a lot of samples with which we can do our development. And we use that on bacteria and viruses. But today, I'm going to talk mostly about viruses. And one of those applications is um, enteroviral um, sequencing, because actually, it's a kind of interesting it's an RNA, RNA virus. It affects millions of people. And um, clinical manifestations are very broad, going from, from like a sore throat to a diarrhea, but also to neurologic disorders. And uh, the genome also, it's about seven to eight KBs. So it's very amenable to, uh, to our, I mean, not only cDNA sequencing, but also direct RNA sequencing. And the questions we had, where uh, can we obtain whole genome sequencing of enterovirus strains in culture or directly from native samples using nanopore sequencing? And then what can we do with that? So how good is the quality for our clinical applications? So this is a typical, um, let's say, protocol going from, or traditional protocol going from RNA to, uh, to cDNA, um, sorry, and um, then you need to go to PCR because very often the target it has a very low concentration and then you go to sequencing. And this is our uh, wet lab protocol um, where we start from a culture and it takes already five to ten days to just get the culture. Not all enterovirus can I mean, produce a, a positive culture. Then we go to uh, RNA extraction, um, cDNA synthesis, uh, cDNA amplification with very often some specific um, primers, long-range PCR here, of course, and then we do the, lab, the library preparation. The dry lab, I'm not going to go into detail, but again, we follow a very traditional pipeline with pore tools um, using BWA or other aligners against the uh, local database, and finally using nanopolish and to get the final genome sequence. And when we did that, I think, I think we should really put emphasis on, on the advantage of the technique because it's, I think it's very important that each nanopore sequences only one strand, one molecule. And you can get some here, some, I mean, it looks unspecific, but actually the primer here are just um, hybridizing on different parts of, of the genome. And when you put just this complex mixture of amplicons uh, onto your flow cell, you're going to just get everything that will match your, your, your target genome. And we were very happy that our, uh, let's say, the expected size was found um, among our, uh, here in the, in the outputs. And it's very easy to get a coverage of 100x and more, depending on how long you let your, uh, your flow cell run. And for instance, here, this is a complete genome of, uh, of a Coxsackie virus, A16, based, again, on cDNA amplicon, and this is based on the 1D technology. Now, when you discuss this, those results with colleagues, they say, but just show me the, the, you know, the reads. And then when you show that to, let's say, to bioinformaticians, then they get very suspicious. Because they say, well, you know, you have a lot of indels, you have problems with homopolymers. So what we say, we say, well, yeah, but we have a lot of those reads. And you can really look at the accumulation plot so that you can correct. But how is then, how, how good is the correction? So what we did is we aligned those reads to the closest reference genome. We extracted the consensus sequence from a BAM file. And then what we did, we just validated this approach by comparing the indels and errors you may find based on the sequencing of the same locus, but using Zenger sequencing. 
And this is the result of, of a, a long run. Well, 16 hours is pretty long because it's cDNA based here. And what you see is that you get something like 98.8% .8 consensus accuracy. Again, piling up different reads and looking at you know, the, the base that is, uh, well, uh, what is being uh, the majority there. And it's based on something like 4,000, 8,000 reads, you get 98.8. .8. And if you let it run further and you just accumulate more and more depth, so more and more coverage, what you see is that your accuracy, your consensus accuracy, is not increasing so much. You go to 99.1%. This is 1D, okay, just to make clear. And, well, sorry, and if you just use the first folders, like the first, first 4,000 reads, and you apply nanopolish, you get this quantic jump from 98.8 uh, .8 to 99.8, and you will never reach that point, you know, that was 99.8, even if you let it run 48 hours. All right. Okay, so I think for amplicon sequencing, so here's cDNA sequencing, I think we can stop you know, after just, just a few minutes, we're talking about just five, 10 minutes, and directly you know, go to the bioinformatic pipeline and just try to correct. Um, and if you look closer at the, um, well, so here on the, on the top, you have the consensus from the BAM file, it's an N, so it could not be called it. Nanopolish gives a, a T, Timidin, and Zanger a T. But if you look closer at the composition, you see that you have about 36%, uh, 35% of C and Ts. So it's a kind of a mix, uh, in a mixed case. So at the end, what was not found was, in fact, probably because here we have a, a mixture. So we're talking about variants and not just about errors. So we are reaching the point where biology starts to make, make sense. Direct, direct RNA sequencing, where we skip two steps. So that's cool because there's no amplification, there's no problem of, of enzyme and, and so on. And it's much faster. Here we got a stool sample that was positive. So this is, we're talking about May, June this year. Um, by RTQPCR, we have a, a protocol to enrich for specific the particles for, of the virus. We do extraction using the robot, so it's compatible with uh, you know, the pipeline that we use in the routine diagnostics. And we do a, a short prep here. And here we loaded only 100, 140 nanograms, and we say, well, whatever, it's what we got from the sample, just let it run on the flow cell. And then again, went through the bioinformatic pipeline. We let it run for 12 hours, because we knew we didn't have enough um, well, material to start with. And we got 120,000 reads, from which 28,000 were I mean, past the base, the base calling with albacore. And on the, from those, only 11 were, in fact, matching enteroviral uh, reads, and the vast majority here were matching yeast, and here we have a huge diversity of yeast RNA, so it's messenger RNA that we co-sequence co in that case, and seven of bacteria, and I think there was only one, read, one human transcript, about 20 uh, bases, so a very, very short one. And what is exciting is that then you start getting, like on one read here, we got the, nearly the full sequence of the, of the RNA genome, of the RNA genome. So we could really, I mean, here, this is really, you know, well, now you know what it is clearly because you have one read and you know also the kind of genomic uh, organization this virus has. So you can look at, uh, you know, rearrangements if they are present. Oops. Okay, and if you align that, what you see here is that, um, well, this is a reference genome on top, and you have those 11 reads that are matching, and you see this bias towards the three prime uh, UTR sequencing because this is the way the, the strands go into the nanopore. So I think that's important uh, for the future, so in terms of, uh, of understanding the bias in terms of you know, which region of the genome is more covered as compared to, to, to other technologies. Okay, in summary, uh, cDNA sequencing works great. Uh, 90, more than 95% coverage of the genomes here. Very high consensus accuracy. Sensitivity is that of the PCR assay. So if it's amplifiable, it's sequenceable. Application, of course, we can go into epidemiology uh, when, where time is not critical. And you can also think about hybrid assembly with um, MySeq or Illumina-based approaches or, or, or Zanger sequencing. Um, direct RNA sequencing is the fastest sample to answer turnaround time. There's no amplification, no reverse transcription bias. Um, you have, the problem is that you need to read to get some higher throughput so that we can again pile up some of those reads to get it to better uh, consensus accuracy. And um, finally, so we can say that the, the typical application will be identification at this stage. Okay? And uh, the time frame is very amenable to actionable clinical and public health diagnosis. 
With that, I would like to thank you, uh, my team, so Miguel Terrasos, especially working and implementing in, a, in the wet lab protocols, and um, the Institute for Infectious Disease, the rest of the team, so the director, Stephen Leib, and the co-director, Francisca Suter, many other uh, PI and scientists who are involved in, in, the, um, in the clinical approaches, and collaborators at Oxford Nanopore Technologies for their uh, stimulation and their, um, let's say, their, their support, sorry, in, the, in, in all those uh, development that we are doing. And thank you for your attention. Okay, again, thank you very much, Albon, for that fantastic talk. Do we have a couple of quick questions that we can take for Albon now? Anyone out there? Quick question. Viruses. Okay, all right. Well, in that case, we'll save up, have a think about it. Oh, sorry, I take it back. There is one question right there. I apologize for not spotting you. There you go. Oh, hi. Um, have you tried lower than 140 nanograms for your direct RNA sequencing? Can, can you repeat again? Have you tried using less than uh, 140 nanograms? And if yes, like how <coughs> low? So um, in another experiment, so we actually we had the same sample that I'm talking about, okay? We split it into 0.5 grams of stool. So it was really little amount. And uh, on, on the one hand, we used this EasyMag, and it's a robotic system. So you just put a sample, it does you know, extraction and so on, so that's kind of neat. But it does both DNA and RNA extraction at the same time. And then we do, we do use also trisal extraction. And it, actually we got, uh, so to answer to your question, we didn't try lower, we tried more, if possible, you know, because we know it's already a problem. But in the other manual extraction, we thought by doing manually, you know, this extraction, we could get better, uh, so more uh, RNA and higher quality, but actually at the end, we didn't find it there. So now I'm thinking, you know, especially in a clinical setting, the idea is to, to automatize as much as you can so that there's no much, not too much influence from, the, um, I mean, from, from technicians or for whoever is going to, to handle the, the sample. So I think it's also interesting for us to, to, to look at, you know, the sensitivity and the, yeah, those parameters, like the, the amount of RNA that is needed. Okay, great. I think we'll um, move on at this point to our last speaker and then we'll come back to you in a bit, Albon. Thank you very much.